All right. Good morning, everybody. Welcome once again to Chinese Southern Baptist Church to our Sunday morning service and our 37th anniversary. In case you're wondering what that means, uh, 37 years ago, uh, many of you know this, some of you don't, uh, the Reverend and Mrs. Frank uh, had retired from uh, overseas missions, uh, from being mi missionaries in Hong Kong, came back to the States and decided that uh, they weren't through with ministry. And so decided to uh, plant this church 37 years ago. Um, and we are here today because of their faithfulness and their commitment for the gospel to continue uh, here in Seattle. Um, you know, and it's, 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 Pastor Ring mentioned this uh, a couple of years ago, I think. It's quite um, glorious, I guess you could say that they would come back, plant this church, and then we would then, in turn, send missionaries back overseas. Um, and so what, what, what a joy to see the gospel go, come full circle. Um, and so I uh, hope that you will uh, rejoice. Pastor Ian called me uh, and said that uh, we're going to be eating at Joy Al Seafood, $20 a plate. No, of course he was joking. Um, but... Uh, yeah, we will not be going out to eat today uh, because of COVID restrictions, but I hope that you will uh, take some time to uh, consider uh, just the value of faithfulness in the ministry and uh, that this church is here today because of their faithfulness and uh, what God might do through you and your faithfulness in ministry. Um, this morning, we're in the book of Philippians. We started Philippians eight months ago. And now we have only five more sermons, counting this morning, to finish this book. Uh, that's going to take us to March 28th. And then on April 4th, I'll be preaching an Easter sermon. And then on April 11th, Lord willing, we'll begin 1 Samuel. So we are uh, on the last stretch of Philippians, and then Easter, and then 1 Samuel, as the Lord wills. So... If you would open with me uh, in your Bible to the book of Philippians chapter 4. And this morning we're going to be in verses 10 and then also 14 to 18a. And I'll explain that in just a minute as to why we're skipping verses 11 to 13 for now. We're not skipping them permanently, just for now. And the title of the sermon this morning is Generosity is an Investment in Heaven. Generosity is an investment in heaven. So let's read the text, and I'll open us in a word of prayer, and then we will jump into the sermon this morning. Philippians chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Down in verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. And you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. We'll stop right there in the middle of verse 18. Let's pray. God, today as we uh, celebrate uh, 37 years of you being faithful to this church body to sustain it, that here we are, God, 37 years later in a church parking lot, because of your faithfulness, that there is, that there even is a parking lot and that there are funds to build this awning and that you have provided a way for us to continue to gather and to be with brothers and sisters. Lord, we recognize it is by your faithfulness, the faithfulness that you have demonstrated through the generosity of the saints. God, that we have been able to send out missionaries. We have been able to support other missionaries. We have been able to uh, provide for pastors through the years. The pastoring has been able to be here for 30 plus years. 
through your faithfulness, God, to provide. I pray, Lord, that today you would help us to just reflect on how glorious it is, God, that you give us generous hearts to give to the work of ministry. I pray this all in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. One of my favorite parables is the parable of the shrewd manager in Luke 16. And the reason is that when you first read that parable, at first glance, it it makes no sense. You kind of wonder, why is Jesus telling this parable about a dishonest manager? that his manager commends. What is Jesus getting at? And several months ago, when I went through a series called Confusing Passages, I gave you this main takeaway from that parable. If the unrighteous will be shrewd with their assets to protect and secure their earthly lives, how much more should the righteous be shrewd with their assets? to protect and secure their eternal lives. I think that's the point of the parable. This world will spend great time and energy and effort and money, and they will make significant sacrifices to make sure their investments provide a good return in retirement. And if that's true, how much more should the righteous spend great time and energy and effort and money and make significant sacrifices to make sure that our investments provide a good return in heaven? That's what the sermon is about this morning. That generosity is an investment in heaven. So let's look at our text to see where I get this from. We're going to start with the next position of the text, and then I'll give us application of the text. Now this morning, I'm going to group the text together thematically. That's why I'm skipping over verses 11 to 13. Verse 11 to 13 is kind of an aside, and I'll do two sermons on verses 11 to 13 over the next two weeks. But this morning, we're going to look at it thematically, verse 10. And then verses 14 to 18a. So let's start with our exposition of the text in verse 10, where Paul writes, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Now to understand the context of what Paul is getting at, because if if you're visiting with us this morning, you're jumping right in to the sermon. Um, you need to know what's the context here? What's going on? To understand that, we need to read two passages. So hold your spot here and flip back a page or two or type it in, I guess. Um, Philippians 1, 3 to 5. Let's look at Philippians 1, 3 to 5. Paul writes, I thank my God in all my remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, for you all making my prayer with joy because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Now, when we looked at that text, I had said to you that this word partnership in verse five could easily be interpreted as financial partnership. I think that's how Paul means it here. It certainly means more than that, but probably not less. Now, the second passage we need to look at It's chapter 2. Look with me at chapter 2, verses 25 to 30. Paul writes there, I have thought it necessary to send to you Epaphroditus, my brother and fellow worker and fellow soldier, and your messenger and minister to my need. For he has been longing for you all and has been distressed because you heard that he was ill. Indeed, he was ill, near to death. But God had mercy on him, and not only on him, but on me also, lest I should have sorrow upon sorrow. I am the more eager to send him, therefore, that you may rejoice at seeing him again, that I may be less anxious. So receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Remember, 
Paul's under house arrest in Rome. That's where he's at. Now, Timothy appears to be with Paul in Rome, but we don't know exactly what is the nature of Timothy's access to Paul. Is he able to to see him or not? Is he able to bring him gifts or not? We don't know. So the Philippian church had decided to send one of their own, Epaphroditus, to bring a gift to Paul. Probably some basic necessities. Probably things like clothes, maybe some ointment, books, um, maybe some parchment to write on, perhaps money. You know, it's not until things are taken away that we realize how much we take for granted the simplicities of life. Things like medicine and books and something to write on. How precious these gifts must have been to Paul while he sat in Rome under house arrest. So Paul writes in verse 10, I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. No doubt he, he, he did rejoice greatly when Epaphroditus showed up with his presence and the gifts. And it became a great source of joy for Paul. But what probably brought Paul the most joy was not the gift itself, but what the gift signified. Paul writes, you revived your concern for me. That word revived means to bloom or blossom. Just like flowers that die in the fall. And they're not seen again until the spring. But come springtime, they blossom. Paul says, you have blossomed your concern. What does concern mean here? Concern literally means mind in this, in the Greek, or set your mind. In other words, what Paul is saying is you, I have been on your mind is what he's literally getting at. Paul acknowledges that the Philippians were concerned for him in the past. They were thinking about him. They just had no opportunity to help him. Now, why did they have no opportunity? Paul doesn't say. We don't know. But I'll give you four possibilities real quick. I I like to speculate about things like this and to read commentaries about it. Number one, perhaps financial restraint. We know from 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 2, this is what Paul writes. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. Philippi is in Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. Now, in that context, Paul was taking up an offering for Jerusalem. Paul acknowledges that the Philippian church and Macedonia, they had poverty, and yet they still gave. They still gave out of their poverty. But perhaps they gave all that they had. Perhaps they gave everything they had left to the church in Jerusalem, and now they have nothing more to give to Paul. Or two, perhaps they had no one who was able or willing to take this gift to Paul until Epaphroditus was able or willing. Remember, as we just read, Paul said that Epaphroditus almost died taking this gift to Paul. Travel 2,000 years ago was always risky. It's not like today. Epaphroditus, I don't think it, he's being exaggerative here. I think he's, he's saying, look, he, 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 he could have died to simply bring me some medicine and some books and some ointment. Three, Paul may have refused help from the Philippians because people frequently accuse Paul of being a sponge. Paul had to defend against this accusation on more than one occasion. Or four, Paul may have refused help because he wanted all the funds going to Jerusalem. Jerusalem had had a severe famine. That's why they were taking up this offering. But perhaps now Jerusalem... Uh, that offering in 2 Corinthians, this is about five to six years later. Perhaps Jerusalem now had come out of their famine. They were all well supplied. And now it's Paul who was in need. So maybe that's why Paul had refused help. Whatever the reason, Paul is very clear. He wants 
everyone to know that's going to read this letter, the Philippians' lack of support during this time was not due to a lack of love, but a lack of opportunity. Verse 14, jump down to verse 14. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. Kind is, uh, the word is literally good or well. Yet it was good of you or you did well. That's how the NASB translates it. Nevertheless, you have done well. To what? To share. What does Paul mean by share? The word share literally means to take part in. In this case, it's in the sense of taking a sympathetic interest in. Take a sympathetic interest in what? In trouble. Literally affliction or persecution or tribulation or suffering. Paul is acknowledging that even though he's under house arrest in Rome, the Philippians are taking part in his affliction. They may not be experiencing the same kind of pain that Paul is experiencing, but they do take part in his suffering by providing for his needs. Why does Paul write the word yet here, though? Look at in verse 14. We kind of skip over that sometimes. But remember, every word is inspired by God. Why does Paul say yet? What is the yet getting at? I think because Paul doesn't want the Philippians to get the wrong idea from verses 11 to 13. I'll talk about those two verses. There's three verses uh, in 11, 12, 13. Yeah, three. Uh, over the next two weeks. But Paul doesn't want them to hear when he says, well, I'm not speaking of being in need. I have learned to be content. I've learned the secret of facing hunger and need. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. Paul doesn't want them to hear all this and to think, well, our gifts were a waste. He's already content. He's got this secret in prison. No, Paul is saying it was good, church. You did well, church body, to share in my affliction. Verse 15, and you, you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I left Macedonia, no church entered into partnership with me in giving and receiving except you only. Now this phrase, in the beginning of the gospel, it's a little bit confusing there. You're like, well, the beginning of the gospel, that, that's like before the Philippian church even existed. I think we need to read some supplied words there. You have to do this all the time with Paul. You have to supply words for him to get at what he's saying. I think the supplied words here are, and you Philippians yourselves know that in the beginning of the gospel, supplied in your lives when I left Macedonia. I think he's saying that in the beginning of the gospel, in your life, when I left Macedonia. What Paul is essentially saying is the same thing that he said back in chapter 1, verse 5. Because of your partnership in the gospel from the first day until now. Sometimes we view financial giving as something for the mature or the spiritual or those who have been saved for 10 plus years. But here we see the Philippians began giving to the ministry from day one. Right after their church is founded and planted, they start giving. Paul was in Macedonia in Acts chapter 16 and in the, the first part of Acts 17. But in Acts 17, 16, Paul left Macedonia and he travels to Athens for a short period of time. After he leaves Athens, he then goes to Corinth. And it's in Corinth that he stays there for a year and a half, for 18 months. Over this year and a half to two years, give or take, after he left Macedonia, Paul writes that no church entered into partnership, meaning no church financially supported him except one, Philippi. Not Thessalonica, 
Not Berea, not Athens, not Corinth, but Philippi. Paul even writes to the Corinthians. Look, look, listen to what he says here. 2 Corinthians 11, 7 to 9. Paul writes, Or did I commit a sin and humbling myself so that you might be exalted because I preach the gospel to you free of charge? I robbed other churches. Now that's not literal. He's saying metaphorically speaking. I robbed other churches by accepting support from them in order to serve you. And when I was with you and in need, I did not burden anyone for the brothers who came from Macedonia. Philippi supplied my need. When Paul went to Corinth, he initially was a tent maker and he stayed with Priscilla and Aquila because they were also were tent makers. And we, we assume that Paul was a tent maker for that whole 18 months. That's probably not true. Because when Timothy and Silas came from Philippi, they presumably brought a gift from Philippi. We see this in Acts 18.5. If you read Acts 18.5, depending on the translation you use, you don't see this. But I'm going to read you the translation that I think is accurate. Acts 18.5. When Silas and Timothy came from Macedonia, Paul devoted himself exclusively to preaching. Meaning that Paul started off as a tent maker in Corinth because he needed to support provide for himself. But when Timothy and Silas came from Philippi, they brought financial means to provide for Paul so that he would no longer have to be a tent maker and could devote himself exclusively to preaching. Paul was in need in Corinth, but rather than burden Corinth, brothers from Macedonia, Philippi, came to Corinth and supplied his need. And Paul Never forgot this. He never forgot the church's sacrifice that enabled him to preach the gospel. Verse 16. Even in Thessalonica, you sent me help for my needs once and again. Now, Paul's point here is simply that when he left Philippi, the first place he went was where? Thessalonica. And so again, it's simply affirming that the Philippians truly did enter into financial partnership with Paul from day one. When Paul was in Thessalonica, he was in need. And the Philippians met that need on more than one occasion. And Paul wants to simply highlight that fact. Verse 17, not that I seek the gift, but I seek the fruit that increases to your credit Now, lest there be any in the Philippian church, or really any church, that mistake this text to suggest that Paul is simply one of those preachers who just wants you to give. That's all he cares about is people giving. Maybe even here this morning, when you see this title, you think, That's all this preacher thinks about and cares about is you giving. Lest anybody have that thought. And or lest there be any in the church who think that Paul's motives, why is he praising the Philippians so over the top, right? He's praising them and praising them and praising them. Lest anybody in the church think that he is praising them as a manipulative means to coerce them to giving in the future. Paul is careful to clarify that he is not seeking financial and material support from the Philippians, ultimately. He wants them to know, brothers and sisters, I'm not seeking the gift ultimately. So what is he seeking? The fruit that increases to your credit. What does that mean? It's a great phrase. Let's look at some of the translations. Or if you'll listen to some of the translations. The ESV footnote, if you have ESV, you have a footnote there or an asterisk with a footnote. 
that seek the profit that accrues to your account. NASB, but I seek the profit which increases to your account. NIV, but I'm looking for what may be credited to your account. The Jerusalem Bible gets really close as well. What is valuable to me is the interest that is mounting up in your account. Now, that doesn't solve it, though, just looking at translate. It gives us a little insight, but it still raises the question, what does this mean? To understand this phrase, we need to look at four words. Four words. Seek, fruit, increases, credit. We need to look at those four words individually. So let's, let's do that. Number one, seek. What does it mean to seek? It means to be seriously interested in or to have a strong desire for. Paul says, I am seriously interested. I have a strong desire for what? For fruit. ESV translates it's literal here or wooden here. The word in Greek is literally fruit, but it's probably better translated as profit or interest. Profit or interest. I think Paul is using fruit in the commerce sense here. In the commerce sense, just like we do with bread or dough. You know how we say, man, he's making a lot of bread. He's making a lot of dough. We don't mean like, I mean, if you work at Panera, you are making a lot of bread. But normally you say someone's making a lot of bread, you mean money. That's how Paul's using fruit here. Increases. Uh, What does that mean? To become more and more and so as to be in abundance. And then account. Now, in the Greek, it's it's interesting. Here's the literal meaning of the Greek. In the word of you. In the word of you. It's the same um, root as logos, which means word. Now, the reason it's translated as account, though, is because this was a technical phrase used in business transactions and signified to the account of. That's what it means, to the account of. Now, I think the ESV footnote actually brings out the best translation. I wish they had gone with the footnote because I think it actually brings out the best translation. The profit that accrues to your account. One commentator writes this, Paul considers the Philippians' gift a profitable investment in the service of God, for God will repay them rich dividends by adding interest to their account. But then that still leaves the question, what does that mean? Is Paul preaching prosperity gospel here? It kind of sounds like that. No, he's not. F.F. Bruce summarizes this nicely. Here's what F.F. Bruce writes. The Philippians sending gifts to Paul was a token of heavenly grace in their lives and, so to speak, a deposit in the bank of heaven that will multiply at compound interest to their advantage. I think Bruce summarizes what Paul means very nicely. Paul is not ultimately concerned with his physical and monetary needs. He is concerned with the Philippians' spiritual bank account and its balance in heaven. Verse 18a, I have received full payment and more. I am well supplied, having received from Epaphroditus the gifts you sent. Paul describes the Philippians' support in four phrases. Number one, I have received full payment. That's five words in English, but it's only two words in Greek. Full payment may not be the best translation because that kind of sounds like it was something owed to Paul, like the Philippians owed him something and then they were just paying him what they owed him. But this fourth phrase, gifts, tells us that that's not true. It wasn't a payment. It probably should be translated as the NASB does, but I have received everything in full. I've received everything in full. Two, and more. Normally translated as abundance or abounding. You know how when you're hungry and you go over to your grandma's house, you don't just get full. 
You abound. You eat in abundance until you can't eat anymore. That's the idea here. Three, well supplied. Simply means full. Paul writes, I am full, church. I'm full. And four, gifts, which is actually not there in the Greek. The word gifts is actually not there in the Greek. Literally, the things from you. That's what it literally is. The things from you. And Paul, once again, takes the time to recognize this man that we've looked at before, Epaphroditus. Paul had previously written about this man. Receive him in the Lord with all joy and honor such men, for he nearly died for the work of Christ, risking his life to complete what was lacking in your service to me. Paul had poured out his life for the Philippian salvation. The Philippians had poured out their resources for Paul's needs. And Epaphroditus risked his life to make those resources possible. And that's our exposition of the text. Now, application of the text. I have eight short points of application. So let's jump into those. Number one, generosity not only gives a gift, but also the gift of joy. Generosity not only gives a gift, but also the gift of joy. What I find interesting in verse 10 is that we would expect some form of thanksgiving from Paul. That's what he writes back in chapter 1, verse 3. I thank my God in all my remembrance of you because of your partnership in the gospel. But here, there's no such thanksgiving, but rather a statement of joy. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly. The Philippians' generosity, their concern, gave Paul reason to rejoice in the Lord. When we express kindness and generosity and care and concern for one another, whenever we do that, we are never simply giving someone finances, a ride, a note, a compliment, a baked treat, a drink, some money, we are also giving them a reason to rejoice in the Lord greatly. James writes, every good and perfect gift is from above. And we remind people of that truth every time we give. Two, out of sight, on the mind. Out of sight, on the mind. We have this phrase, out of sight, out of mind. This may go for things like dirty clothes in the closet. You got dirty clothes, throw them in the closet. Out of sight, out of mind. Filing taxes during tax season. A stack of paperwork that you need to fill out. Bills that you have to pay. Dishes in the sink. Out of sight, out of mind. But that was not true for the Philippians when it came to people. And neither should it be true for us. Paul writes, you revived your concern for me. Literally, uh, you blossomed and setting your mind on me. That's how we would literally translate it. You blossomed and setting your mind on me. But keep in mind, Paul was in Rome. The Philippians were in Macedonia. There's no cell phones. There's no texting. There's no apps. There's no social media. There's no, even if you wrote a letter, it might be weeks or months before it got there. Paul's in Rome. They're in Macedonia. It may have been many months. It may have even been many years since they saw each other. And yet it was not out of sight, out of mind. It was out of sight, on the mind. When someone hasn't been in church in a while, 
Let's practice out of sight on the mind. When someone hasn't been in your inner circle for a while, let's practice out of sight on the mind. It takes intentionality. It does. Some people are good at this naturally. Some of you, you just naturally are good at this. And others like myself have to work so very hard to do this. But it's worth it. It's worth it, church body. Three, for God's people, let our default be assuming the best, not the worst. When it comes to God's people, let our default be assuming the best, not the worst. For reasons that Paul did not tell us, the Philippians had a period of time, may have been months, may have been years, where they didn't support Paul. And as far as we know, Paul may not have even known what those reasons were. Maybe he did, maybe he didn't. But what happens so often in the Christian life is that we can assume the worst in others, especially when we are hurting, when we are wounded, when we are offended, when we're going through a trial, when we're in need. I remember in seminary, they would tell us, listen, pastor, you're going to get an email one day that says, dear pastor, my aunt was sick last week and in the hospital and you didn't even call me or visit her. And the reality is you had no idea. You had no idea she was in the hospital. It's not that you didn't care. It's that you had no opportunity to care because you had no idea. Sometimes in the church, we can put expectations on people. And if and when they don't meet those expectations, we assume the worst. We assume that they didn't meet our expectations because they don't care. But Paul teaches us to assume the best with God's people. Now, maybe they don't care. Maybe that's true, but we don't know that. He affirms the Philippians. He says to them, you were concerned for me. Meaning, how does, how does he assumes? I mean, maybe he knows this. Maybe he doesn't. We don't know. But if he doesn't know, he assumes they were concerned for him. You just didn't have the opportunity. I want to encourage you, church family, when it comes to God's people, let our default be assuming the best, not the worst. Four, don't let the increase of wealth cause our grip to increase. Don't let the increase of wealth cause our grip to increase. Now, we don't know if the Philippians had no opportunity to help because they were poor. We do know they had financial struggles. But we also know that as their finances decreased, so did their grip. Let me show this to you. Hold your spot. Flip back to 2 Corinthians 8. We read part of this earlier. 2 Corinthians 8, 1 to 4. Listen to this. We want you to know, brothers, about the grace of God that has been given among the churches of Macedonia. For in a severe test of affliction, their abundance of joy and their extreme poverty have overflowed in a wealth of generosity on their part. For they gave according to their means, and I can testify, and beyond their means, as of their own accord, begging us earnestly for the favor of taking part in the relief of the saints." Here they are in extreme poverty and they are not only giving, they are giving beyond their means. And not only are they giving beyond their means, they are begging Paul, let us do this, Paul. Let us give to the saints in Jerusalem. 
I'm not going to bore us with statistics, but it is a well-documented fact that the poor give more per capita. It is a well-documented fact that the poor give more per capita. There's something about getting more money that makes us want to hold on to it more. As numbers increase, so does our grip. I know this because I feel it. When I was in seminary, I was an interim pulpit supply for about four to six months at this small church in White Castle, Louisiana. They would pay me a stipend each week. But one day they told me they wanted to take up a love offering for me. Now you have to know, this small church was made up of, of completely made up of people between the ages of 60 to 80. Uh, they were retired. They were on Social Security. They are not rich by any means. I mean, it was a, a very poor community. And here they are telling me they want to take up a love offering for me. And, and I tried to refuse it. I, I, I said, no, no, no. Like, I, I, I would come in for free. Like, I'm just happy to be able to have the pulpit. And the head deacon said, you have to let the church do this. Brothers and sisters, don't let the increase of our wealth cause our grip to increase. Number five is a quote from a commentator named Joette. This is what they write. God does not comfort us to make us comfortable, but to make us comforters. God does not comfort us to make us comfortable, but to make us comforters. We're going through 2 Corinthians in our small group right now. Um, and I brought up this quote a couple weeks ago. Two weeks ago, this is what we read from 2 Corinthians. Blessed be the God of all comfort who comforts us in all our affliction so that we may be able to comfort those who are in any affliction with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. Paul was in prison. The Philippians were free. And yet the Philippians joined Paul in his affliction. Paul writes in verse 14, Nevertheless, you have done well to share in my affliction. The Philippians used their freedom to bring comfort to Paul. God does not comfort us to make us comfortable, but to make us comforters. Number six, pay honor to whom honor is owed. Pay honor to whom honor is owed. This comes from Romans 13, 7, where Paul writes, pay honor to whom honor is owed. The Philippians were owed honor. That's why Paul took the time to honor them in this letter. Now, keep in mind, these letters that Paul wrote and other apostles wrote, they were circulated among the churches. Now, I don't know how the other churches took verse 15, that no one entered into the gospel except Philippi. I don't know how other churches took this. But nevertheless, Paul, Paul's point is that the church at Philippi was worthy of being honored, so he honored them. Paul point is that Epaphroditus was worthy of honor, so he honored him. And Paul even tells the Philippians church that when he sends Epaphroditus back, he says, honor such men. And so since we should pay honor to whom honor is owed, I want to pause for just a minute to talk about your giving. 
This June will be 10 years at CSBC for us. Over those 10 years, my wife has never had to work for finances. She's had to work. My wife has never had to get a job. We live in one of the most expensive cities in America with four kids on one income for 10 years. When we had three kids living in an apartment and we found out that we were pregnant with the fourth, Ivan sprang into action to find us a home. A home that we still live in eight years later. When we told Ivan that the rent price was more than we could afford, he asked the church if they would increase our salary. And they did. The laptop that I use, this tablet that I use, the boots that I wore to go snow tubing in yesterday, my wife's tooth, her $6,000 implant, the couches in our house. One of the most spiritually impactful trips of my life in Minnesota. The chair in my study in my house. The chair in my study at church. All of it and more was provided by you, church family. We have never missed a meal. We have never missed a bill payment. We have never missed a rent payment. We have never missed any opportunity that we wanted because of you. Church family, you have faithfully given. You have faithfully given. And this is not even to mention, we don't even have time to go into how you give to missions and you shatter our missions goal every single time. Which, by the way, we're starting Annie Armstrong. Our church goal is $1,000. And you will shatter that as well. Pay honor to whom honor is owed. Seven, we all have gifts that differ according to the grace given us. Paul writes in Romans 12, 6 to 8, having gifts that differ according to the grace given us, let us use them. If prophecy in proportion to our faith, if service in our serving, the one who teaches in his teaching, the one who exhorts in his exhortation, the one who contributes in his generosity, the one who leads with zeal, and the one who... Uh, does acts of mercy with cheerfulness. We see the body of Christ operating the way that it should here. Paul used his gifts of prophecy and teaching and exhortation. Philippi used their gifts of generosity and mercy. Epaphroditus used his gifts of serving and leading by example and faith to trust God on the journey to Rome, God has given all of us in Christ gifts, gifts to use. And when the body of Christ uses our gifts according to the grace that's given us, it is, as we will talk about in a few weeks, a fragrant offering, a sacrifice acceptable and pleasing to God, as Paul says. And number eight, last point. There is only one investment that is risk-free, guaranteed returns, and eternal dividends. There is only one investment that is risk-free, guaranteed returns, and eternal dividends. I seek the fruit that increases to your credit. What a great statement by Paul. I seek 
the profit that accrues to your account. Church family, every time we give, every time we are generous with our money, with our time, with our possessions, with our care, with our concern, it is producing an increase in our heavenly spiritual bank account. Now, if you're visiting here, let me, not literally, you know, it's like you get like money in heaven. Money would be meaningless in heaven. You get joy in heaven. Jesus says, do not lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. If you, Jesus said to the rich young ruler, if you would be perfect, go and sell all that you possess and you will have treasure in heaven. Can you imagine trading heaven for some retirement or whatever the rich young ruler was living for? He couldn't give up his investments in this life. When Jesus offered him eternal happiness in heaven. Paul writes, the rich are to do good. To be rich in good works. To be generous and ready to share. Thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future. Every time you give. You are storing up treasure for yourself as a good foundation for the future. There is only one investment that is risk-free. Guaranteed returns and eternal dividends. And I seek that investment for you and for me.